I'm Katie Taitler, Senior Analyst with Tech Cyber, and I'm here today with Mindcast's Principal Security Strategist, Matthew Gardner. Hello, how are you? Thanks for joining me on uh, today, a gray, rainy day in the Boston area where we both are, but, but thanks for being part of this. Uh, today, we're here to talk about email and web security and, and why protecting these properties is a front line of defense. You know, uh, email and web are obviously two of the so-called perimeters of an organization, if we can even call it that. And, you know, there's some argument about what a perimeter even means today. Um, but if we consider them a perimeter of sorts, they are also some of the easiest vectors of attack for cyber criminals because people need their email, we need to access messages, we need to click on links and download attachments, the valid ones, the real ones. We need to send information. And email is one of the easiest productivity tools that we have in business. And the same Everybody goes for websites. It. Websites tell our customers and our potential customers about our businesses. They make it easy for people to learn about our company and what we do. But the ease of use, the accessibility, the ubiquity also make them some of the riskiest tools from a cybersecurity perspective. So, Matthew, before we get to Mimecast specifically, let's talk about that. And in particular, the last few months, how they've presented extra challenges in terms of protecting email accounts and web properties. Talk a little bit about some of the things you've seen and heard. Yeah, th thanks for having me. Um, you know, it really comes down to the concept of social engineering, the fastest and easiest and best way usually into an organization is through your people. And so they reach out and touch you. And these, you know, at least the external attackers initially come into your perimeter. And so you mentioned the perimeter, obviously the concept of a perimeter is different. I'd still argue there is a perimeter. It's just, uh, it's essentially whatever is around your people is your perimeter. It used to be a, you know, a firewall on your corporate network. Now it's, you know, not that, but it's still, you have applications and you have systems that people use. And so attackers try to get through them and they try to get through them to your people because they can let you in essentially. And email and the web are the two by, by far most popular ways for your people to, unbeknownst to them, let the attacker in in some way or form. So we know we've heard, you know, surveys have said and, and the media have reported that email has increased. I read one statistic that the volume of email increased by about 95% because everybody's working from home, because you can't go over to your coworker and say, hey, Matthew, well, you know, ask, what about this? Can you help me with that? But there's another aspect, domain spoofing, that's been on the rise. What have you seen in regards to domain spoofing? And is this something you think will continue to be a trend? Or are there other things that you know you see coming down the pike? I mean, domain spoofing is part and parcel of social engineering. I mean, they're trying to make you think there's someone they're not. Your boss, your colleague, your vendor, whatever, customer, um, you know, uh, HR rep, whatever. They're trying to make you pretend there's somebody they're not. And so they they put it in the content of the mail, but also they pretend to send from a domain that's similar to what you might expect um, or exactly what you might expect. And we can talk a little bit about how that's possible in email. And similar on the web world, you know, they're trying to bring you to a site that they control that you think is something else, usually to steal a credential, um, but not always. They're, you know, they might be there to steal something else. But at the end of the day, it's part and parcel of a social engineering, and they want you to trust them, and they use multiple techniques to do that. And you know, they're it's very, very successful. Surprise, surprise. So they keep doing it, um, and so you have to have techniques to you know try to stop them. Anything. You know, domain spoofing and, and email phishing, um, social engineering, those are all obvious and they've been around forever. Anything that you see that's novel? Um, yeah. Or do you think yeah, attackers absolutely. will just continue to go for the low hanging fruit? Uh, I mean, most people think about domain spoofing being an attack that reaches your organization, and that's traditionally what inbound phishing is or what 
credential stealing is. They hit you, they're trying to steal your users' logins or plant malware in your organization. So that, that continues on. But the, the area people don't think about and they need to is taking exploiting your brand to someone else. So it's not just Microsoft, eBay, and PayPal, and Netflix that experience that. They experience it most often, for sure, because they're global internet brands. But you know, your local bank, your local law firm, you know, your local consultant, whatever, their brand can be spoofed and hit use the trust embedded in that brand to their customers, to their partners. So that you know, it raises an interesting problem of how do you stop an attack that actually doesn't hit your organization but uses your brand and so you are damaged right it's not the traditional kind of attack that companies think of first right and it you know you, you usually want to lock down your world as best you can make it safe but that's unfortunately not enough particularly now that everybody's brand is an online brand with very few exceptions and so you're recognized your online presence is recognized by huge swaths of people and those people are attractive to attackers. And while it's, um, you know, while Netflix, PayPal and eBay and whatnot are, you know, still in the top 10 always every, every you know, anti-phishing working group top 10 basically, yeah, they're pretty effective at protecting their brand online. Um, whereas the attackers have discovered, not surprisingly, that a lot of the other types of lesser brands, you know, lesser known companies are not very good. And so they can set up websites and send email for a long time and never get caught. And so they can be harvesting, you know, your users' logins, you know, um, attacking your users or your partners or your anyone who trusts your brand for an extended period of time without anyone doing anything about it. And that's, you know, attractive from their point of view. Sure, it's it, it's a different way of going about exploiting a company, yeah. which is a nice segue into my next question, which is about Momcast and your three zones of protection. So mm -hmm. you tout that a lot. Um, explain to everybody, what does that really mean? What are the three zones? Why the three zones? Yeah, so it's basically us pivoting to how attackers attack, at least within the domains that, that we can help protect, which is, Email on the web that we are two of the two of the key vectors that we have we have defenses for. So you know traditional phishing is inbound into your organization, whether you're using Office 365 or not. Your people are sitting on an email system that an attacker would love to get in uh, into, steal credentials or you know drop software, or drop malware, and so you have to have those defenses against you know against you know your perimeter, whether it's a cloud-based perimeter or whether it's a traditional perimeter. So we have, we protect, we have, you know, protections in, in that vector, but then there's the, what do they do when they get there problem? And so usually when they steal credentials or land, land malware in your organization, they don't exploit, they spread. So their, their next goal for the most attackers is to spread internally. So you need controls on your email and even in your, you know, your web inspection for for a lateral movement, east-west movement of attacks. So we we build some controls there, which include technical controls as well as awareness training, because of course now your people are inside and you need them to be part of your defense. And then finally, the the third zone, if you will, is you know outside your perimeter. You know, these are the attacks we were just talking about. They're they're leveraging your brand, whether it's via email, so they're pretending to be you via email, and or they're pretending to be you on the web. Um, how do you find, block, take down uh, quickly those types of attacks uh, to protect your brand, basically? And so we have our security controls are, are built around those three zones. Customers can use some or all of those zones to you know, better protect their organization as they go. So looking at it from an outside-in perspective, almost like a beyond court model, it's external perimeter again wherever the perimeter may be maybe not a firewall but your people yep. their identity and then internal that makes a lot of sense and then out and then the outside world just generally yeah, yeah now, that's that's something i like about is we you know we're not building security controls to mimic the on-premises history of security where we have a cloud-based platform 
that's expanding and moving based on the attackers. And so, you know, we can maybe we'll get into this, but basically, you need people need to rethink how they do security controls for both efficiency and effectiveness. And we think a cloud-based platform, not that it's not going to do every control ever imagined for sure, but you can assemble a set of cloud-based platforms for identity, you know, for access control, for email and web security, for some other areas, and you can assemble a pretty effective security control from the cloud as opposed to having to assemble all these pieces we traditionally did on premises. Right. It's easier to deploy. It's easier to manage. It's easier to get, exactly. you know, sort of an aggregated view across environments exactly. from the cloud. Yep. That's that's what we you do. Something a minute ago, I want to return to security awareness training because a lot has been made of security awareness training in the past, and I have some pretty pretty um, committed views on security awareness training. And it's a big part of hardening that first line of defense. But what do you think about security awareness training? How useful is it? And where does technology need to take over? So I, I'll, I'll, first, I always call it the last line of defense because it's literally your people. And so the first line of defense, hopefully, is technology and things out there to try to stop the bad thing from entering. But obviously, there's no, there's nothing perfect. Um, and so, as a last line of defense, you want your people. They got to be aware. They have to have understanding, and they have to be able to take an action. Understand that they need to take an action, and what actions they should and shouldn't do. And so, I think the good part of security awareness training is the security industry has understood that it's an important part of the overall program. Like years ago, we didn't, we never talked about your people being part of your security program or posture. Now everybody pretty understands that pretty well. Survey work we do is something like 90 something percent of organizations do security awareness training in quote. They're not, it's not very effective in most cases for, for, you know, it's not timely. It's not interesting. It's not engaging. It's not memorable, but they're trying, you know, so that's a good, a good step in the right direction. You know, we find that, you know, you need to pivot your security awareness training to basically the YouTube generation or the Instagram or whatever, TikTok. You know, that's the people you're really, you know, the consumers like that, which includes myself. You know, it's not just a, a young person thing. Um, it has to be timely, engaging, interesting, memorable. Um, and so I think platforms that do that and that also integrate in with your technical controls are 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 able to move the needle in the right direction. Well, I will say, if you, Matthew, personally make a TikTok of security awareness, we will post it on, on, on Tag Cyber happen, for you. But, but, uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I agree with you. These, these types of programs, they, they do have to be engaging. They do have to be interesting. But they also need to be bolstered by technology. Mm, definitely. My people are aware we're going to be X amount better because the attackers are people and they're going to figure out how to get around people. Uh, absolutely. And you, and, and they should be not just two parts of a program, they should be integrated. Meaning you're, you're in the real world of protections, you're seeing people engage when they shouldn't. In the real world of training, you're seeing like simulation, your uh, phishing simulation, you're seeing people engage when they shouldn't. You know, so instead of treating all your people as exactly the same, you should treat your your more in quote important people or more attacked people or weaker security you know people differently and focus more on them. Maybe, maybe it's training, maybe it's technical controls, but you know that's the thing when you can integrate your technical controls and your awareness training, you can get some you know sort of the one plus one equals three, and get more leverage out of both systems. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a layered approach is, I, I don't think we're ever going to get to a place where we're beyond a layered approach to security. It just needs to be there. And, yeah, and, and AI is not the magic bullet either, although it's very useful. Come on. It's not the magic bullet, sorry to say. <laughs> we use it, it heavily, but we also use other things as well. And, and you know, like people are the final layer and uh, they can be a great asset. Like if you have people, it's just like, you know, if you see it, report it, like you see in the physical security world, like on a subway or something, 
same deal. You know, if you see it, report it, because you may be the first person to see some threat or see some anomaly that we try to pick up with technical controls or AI or machine learning, but people are the most awesomest, you know, detectors of anomalies if they're paying attention and know what to do when they when they see it. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Another thing that's not a silver bullet, but was hoping to be a silver bullet was compliance. Um, over the years, we've seen a bunch of security and privacy regulations, and another big one is about to hit Canada. Can you tell us a bit about that and what the implications of this new law, along with GDPR, CCPA, and others, will be for organizations? Is this changing the way companies protect their data? Should it? Yeah, so I mean, I, I like it, like these types of laws on one hand, and I dislike them on the other hand. Um, so on the positive side, I like the little shake that it gives people, and it gives security, and it's historically, as, as these laws have evolved in different countries, it's given the security people a little bit more gravitas in the company. It becomes a, a legal issue because it's compliance and it's a risk management issue because there's financial penalties if you misbehave or don't behave as well as you should. Um, you know, it has the privacy implications that's, you know, obviously so topical right now because of, you know, social media. So it does, the benefit is it's it says, you know, if if people weren't aware, if upper management wasn't aware, they are they've really got to be aware because there's laws have been passed in their jurisdiction that says it's your responsibility to, you know, to keep data secure and you know sensitive data out of the hands of the wrong people and use it appropriately, et cetera. The part of it I don't like is I don't love in most cases the penalties that get added on to what are effectively victims of cyber attacks. Um, you know, you see these 100 million this and 100 pounds of that, million pounds of that. You know, I don't love kicking victims. I mean, that's ultimately, unless somebody is completely unreasonable in their security program, you know, like a, a security person would go in there and go, you are completely deficient. Okay, then I can understand, you know, pushing the pushing the penalty on them. But in most cases, they just happen to be incredibly unlucky. And you know they have deficiencies, obviously, but everybody has deficiencies. And so, does it really help the world become more secure to extract another fifty million dollars from Company X when perhaps that could be put into better security controls? So you know, I just I, I'm a little I'm a little squeamish about stepping on the wound of, of victims unless they were completely negligent. Yeah, it's hard because regulations can be a great lever for security people to push, but it, it shouldn't be the only lever that they can push to get the attention that's needed to protect and, your and people, also, your data, your systems. I'm also very, I've, I've seen some political talk, I think it was in New York State, talking about regulating tighter and down to the point of like overseeing security controls. And that makes me very nervous having non-experts you know reaching into a private entity and saying this is you must do this this and this to be more secure because it's very unlikely to be flexible very unlikely to be value driven or risk driven um so i mean i, I think in general you know the government's role is to say hey this is important you know you're we're responsible for this data um you know through the through the through the regulations you mentioned but i think the for the the government's better role or more efficient or effective role is law enforcement so that obviously companies can't chase down bad guys and put them in jail but governments can even though it's hard when you're crossing you know international borders but they can do it the fbi can do it and i i can't do it um and you know they could they can protect the public institutions which obviously have not been very effective either. So, you know, maybe they should focus on their home base a little bit so that they're not ransomed and, you know, and, uh, you know, wire transferred money outside out of the public purse and all that stuff that happens. So I don't know, I just, I just, this, it, the world is complicated enough in security. And I think private companies 
you know, have enough incentive to do the right thing and it's complicated and, you know, there's, there's work to be done, but, you know, there's, there's staying at a high level regulation, I think it's probably a wiser, wiser level. That all makes sense. And, and certainly we've been working with MomCast for a couple of years now. We like what you're doing. We think you guys are trying to do the right thing. So one more quick question here. I don't want to keep you too long, but what new things or capabilities can people expect to see from Mimecast in the coming months in 2021 and beyond, yeah. perhaps? Yeah, I mean, we're very active investing in our platform. I mean, it is a cloud-based platform that has been, you know, I've been here for about five years. It's been getting deeper in its capabilities and, and wider in its capabilities. So, it's, um, and, you know, in the big picture, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build that platform. It's not going to have every security control in the world, obviously, but it's going to be a hub of key security controls that we're good at that interoperate with other security controls, ideally in the cloud, it can be on-premises, but mostly in the cloud. So along those lines, what we've been doing is also integrating out, so integrating our, our cloud services via open APIs to third parties. So we actually just announced CrowdStrike uh, yesterday, I think it was, their Falcon oh, great. platform. Congratulations. But we have more than 50 of those because you know the idea is that we want to be a hub of what we're good at and integrate with with other third parties that you know are co in common use. But then also as we build the scope of our platform, have it also be integrated so that we talked about like security awareness training being integrated with, with technical controls. So one example um, that we're coming out with is called Safe Fish, which is where we take real fishes that came at your company that your people engaged with actually, obviously we're protected in that case by Mimecast, but it shows there was something there that was interesting or ineffective from the attacker's point of view and put it into a library in our simulation part of our security awareness training so that you know, your IT or security people can use that in simulation. So then no longer do they have to always create something. They can do that, but no longer do they have to create something to simulate. They can take real fishes and just deploy them, obviously, safely. Um, well, and that makes it real, too, not just for the person who saw it or reported it or experienced it, but for everybody else in the organization. Yeah, the, the idea being that it's topical, it's timely, probably. It's probably why the person engaged. So why create something out of your mind? You know, just use something that's real. There's also- Steal from the attackers, they steal from us. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, we, have a, we have a thing that's coming called bring your own threat intelligence, which is, you know, you have this Mimecast cloud that's stopping malware, but you have other malware services like CrowdStrike probably being a good example of something that detects malware. Why not feed the Mimecast service with your best sources of malware detection? You know, your hashes basically of bad stuff that you, you find out from your IT ISAT or your ISAC or CERT or some source maybe we don't have. Tell us and we'll block it up in the, um, you know, up in our cloud service. So there's this idea of this sort of bi-directional integration that we open up with our API, which allows you to essentially bring your own threat intelligence to the to the Mimecast service. Many other examples, I'll, I'll throw one more out and then we can see if we have time, but is sure. this idea of managed services. So we have specialized managed services as part of our security services. Um, you know, one is the implementation of DMARC. If, if for those who are familiar with DMARC, we have a the service team that, that enables that. We have our our brand exploitation discovery team that finds and takes down on your behalf sites that are that are knocking off your 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 websites, you know, and taking them down on your behalf. Um, you know, given the the staffing problems people have in security and you know the efficiency, blah, 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 the the need to outsource security services is bigger than ever. And so what we're continuing to do is add managed services on top of our platform so we can do more for you, generally more efficiently than you can do yourself. So there's a, like a win-win. So the next one we're working on now is basically 
you know, when when uh, when your people get suspicious emails, you know, they have the ability today to send it to Mimecast and send it to your IT people, and then that's the end of it. Obviously, we use it, but what we're doing, you know, with our upcoming managed services res is evaluating and responding back to the company and saying, you know, that was real, this was not. These are these are this is an attack you may want to be aware of in other parts of your security controls, you know, new type of malware or whatever. Um, so it's a service basically providing information intelligence back to the organization, um, kind of what a what a security operations center would do, a piece of what they would do. We'll, we'll offer that as a managed service in the not too distant future. Sounds great. It, it sounds exciting. It's funny. A few years ago, everybody was worried that robots were going to take over their job. But in security, we're adding more resources to have that human touch because it really is that combination of automation, the technology with the human insight that, that yeah, you can't it, get yet. I mean, maybe like, we'll get there someday. Like you said, maybe one day AI will be yeah. the silver bullet, but it sure isn't today. I mean, it's just like automation and every other factor it's making your people more efficient and effective and taking them out of the drudgery work whatever that work is in yeah. this case it happens to be security so in my view security people at a given company should be like the risk managers the advisors on IT security they shouldn't be like patching you know platforms and you know writing detailed rules as much as you know as, as much as they do now or up, you know uploading software they should get out of that drudgery which is essentially what the cloud is all about and and be able to apply their expertise on risk management like what's the riskiest thing we have how well is it defended you know what are my alternatives to better protect it and then essentially outsource a lot of the controls to cloud providers and be obviously the you know the, the the portfolio manager essentially of security controls and so i think that would be a much more effective use of you know scarce security resources is to is to essentially continue to up level the people which is really what automation is is always about i love that i love that well matthew thank you so much for being here and for talking about security in general and for mimecast specifically for everybody watching and listening, please check out Mimecast and what they do, the great company. As I said, we've been working with them for a few years. Matthew, thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. Look forward to it.